All right, let's just start with prayer. Then. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we come here today to ponder, to think about the coming of your Son as man is right for the Holy Eucharist. May you recognize your goodness to us and love him more truly who saved us and lost us. We entrust this time to the hands of our mother as we say. Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Why? 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 Article 9, uh, was that? Yeah, four. Article 9, Article 8, kind of summarizes for these reasons. That God became man, Christ, that the Word became flesh to save us. Right, us with God. To so help us know God's love for us, come out of holiness for us, these partakers of the divine nature. Let me just pause real quick on, on, on that term. That, that's Actor, and then we'll work on What does it mean to say partakers of the divine nature? And by the way, this is a quote from the letter of St. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. What does the Catechism and what's our bishop, the St. Peter, mean by this phrase? How can I be a partaker of the divine nature? To receive the Eucharist. Yes. To receive the Eucharist. That's part of it. Partaker, um, not, not partaker in that sense. This means that I become a sharer. I share it. The divine nature. Your suffering. So what it, it means is that we actually, through holiness, through grace, we take on a higher likeness to God. We take on a greater union with God. To the extent where we're so close to God, we have a share in his own divine life. So, this is so real. I'm going to kind of talk you by this phrase, before I explain it, um, that some of the church fathers say we become God. Hmm. And the Protestants ran with that all the <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and somebody out of context. Yeah, and totally out of context. But look at this direct from scripture. Um, no other no, they don't literally mean you become eternal, unchanging, perfect, infinite, and the creator. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Nor do they mean that you become the God of the planet. Nor do they mean that you become a God. What's being said here is the transforming power of holiness is so real, it affects you down to the core of who you are. It changes you radically. You take our likeness to God as more than just superficial. But now because you're like God, not because you've had this union with God, you start living and acting and being like God. So you see God face to face. Who can see God but God himself? Who can know God, the Holy Spirit? Uh, you can know God and see God if the beat of the vision of heaven. That you live for eternity. 
in the perfect happiness of God's own life. You start doing what God does. And that this, this union is a real union. You become an adopted member of God's family, adopted, adopted member of the Holy Trinity, you might say. Which again is, is a little bit shocking to, to our ears. Um, don't take it too far. Don't say outside that I become God. That I become divine to worship me. Not that. But the God's worship. But the reality is so real and so profound. The saints say that if you saw a soul as sanctifying grace, you would think it was God. If you look at the book of Revelation, or the end of the book of Revelation, and angels talk to St. John. And even John is a saint, it's confused and bowed down to him. He says, Whoa, wait a minute, hold that John, hold it, hold it, buddy. I'm not God. Only worship God. Because John is so overcome by the angel's greatness and his power and glory, shines for him, he confuses him for God. The saints say if you would see us any soul, any human being, in sanctifying grace, you would confuse them for God until you saw the real thing. That's how profound this change is. That's how real this change is. That is God's desire for us and God's plan for us. It's not God saying, let me live where I live. It's not God saying to us, I'm going to pat you on the head and say, okay, here's a little corner for you. It's God saying, I want to give you my life. I want you to be like me. In the closest way a creature can be. Um, so the words of St. Peter, we go up with First Peter 1 4 of Jesus. Mm -hmm. 1 what? 1 4. Yes. Verses is a blessing and a praise of God. It also goes on, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything that makes for life and devotion. Through knowing he will call us by his own glory and power. We have, we have all the gifts, we, we can be good, we can be holy because we know God. Through these, this, this, this devotion, this faith, these gifts, he has known us the precious and regular promises that through them, you may come to share the divine nature. After escaping from the corruption that's in the world because of evil desire. This is how Peter describes that. It's sharing in the divine nature, becoming like unto God. Psalm 87 um, has a similar reference to this. 87 Psalm. Some of your Books maybe Psalm 86. But Psalm 87, uh, verse, verse seven. It's a short song, um, only five. It's close, but far. Mm -hmm. God rises in the divine council to judgment in the midst of the gods. Well, in verse five, or verse five or six, I declare. God's though you be, 
Offspring of the Most High, all of you, if any more of you shall die, and any princess shall fall. This refers to the, the souls who reject God, bad God. Um, this refers to the, the people of the Old Testament who had the law and had knew God and God. And so again, so this idea, and you, can't, you can't take it too far, um, but it's trying to express there's, there's a reality that God's trying to give us, which is more than just you can live in the same house. It's more than just you can be where I am. There is an utter transformation of, of, of you down to your core. And, there, and, and holiness is more than just you did nice things and God gives you a crown. <laughs> but it's that there is a difference who you are and what. The just and the unjust aren't simply people who did good or bad things, but there is a transformation or a degradation, which is incredible to think about. Um, so this, this is one of the reasons why God became man, is to make us like himself. We say in the one of the prayers uh, that God came to love in us, but he knew and loved in the Son. Sticks like so. Let's go on to Article 1. In each one of these reasons, we see God's immense desire that is to himself so intimately and closely that he became one of us. So great is this gift of God himself to mankind, where the gift we give. Let me pause there. All too often we kind of have this idea in our spiritual life. That my spiritual life begins with me looking for God. My spiritual life begins with me saying, you know what? Get out of my duff, I'm the one to go look for God. It's not where it begins. It begins with God saying, I want them, I love them. Because with God saying, I want them to be with me. God looks for us, God, God came to some day of us, God died for us while we were sinners. It wasn't because we were just holy people, Lord, well, you know what, I'll, I'll die for that and put them to heaven. We were jerks. And the Lord came and said, I love them, and I, you're my child, and I want to get you closer. And so this is something you could spend, should spend, many hours thinking on. God desires your soul. God desires you. Fulton Sheen has this phrase, he talks about salvation as the divine romance. Where God comes to woo the human rights, he woo his bride, the church. God came to violence. God desires you. That's an incredible thought of in spite of ourselves, in spite of who we are, in spite of our failures, in spite of our weaknesses, God desires you. As much as this happened, that we could have come to Him, we could have reached the Bible. We blinded ourselves, we deafened ourselves, we made ourselves sinners. Lost our life and given to us. We already given us life. We had leave and we lost. God said, no, I want them, I want them, I want them to say it. So we could have come to him as we came down to walls. We could understand the divine words who came down as focus of human words. We could have bear the set of angels, we came on the human face, the human heart, even in the world. That's incredible. God desires you. If you were the only person needed this, God would have come out and come closer to be with you and to walk. If you don't get that, I can understand the Eucharist. If you don't get that, I can understand the Eucharist. The Eucharist, is, the, Eucharist is, the Eucharist makes no sense without understanding God loves you enough that He wants to be close to you. Literally, we are what, 40 feet away from God. Just the wall and God. Sitting in a box. It smells like Arizona, a little room. We'd be paying to look great. Like, that's nuts. It's incredible, it's beautiful. Nuts. Kind of reminds me of 
what Scott Hahn said was about the incarnation. He was saying that what can you compare it to? And you struggle for any kind of a realistic comparison. He said, uh, well, maybe uh, you know, here's a dog, and, and you love the dog so much you, you become a dog. But that wasn't sufficient yet. So you also become a dog biscuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the disunion that is moving. It's actually, it, it's, you know. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. <laughs> God is foolish and love for us. But the foolishness of God is wise and the wisdom of man. You never heard. Any of this, uh, I was in the, the late 30s. I went to Catholic elementary school through the seventh grade and I was a regular attendee, attendee at Mass, uh, weekly Mass, a lot of weekday Masses too. But the first time I thought, I heard that, and it wasn't a priest that was saying it, but it was an evangelist, I thought. Sounds like heresy to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it, it, it's, it's nuts. If I'm God, well, am I going to worship myself or what? <laughs> <laughs> Each of these readers, you see God's immense desire, that stuff's infinitely and close, he became one of us. So greater is the gift of God himself to mankind. No greater gift could be given. God is abundantly generous love. And God could have made us for any number of reasons. Why would God make us? Come to know and love and serve Him. Love and serve Him and hear us life and then, then where? Be in heaven and forever again. Yeah. Don't love and serve on this life and forever again. I think I've said this before, but, but, but I do think it's something that people don't quite grasp all the time. When I first heard that, when I was first learning that, I was like, I felt kind of selfish. Right? Because if I would have said, tell you, you're here to know me, love me, and serve me, you would have got to leave the room. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you want to stay, it was going to be silly to say, here. But it's not selfish of God. Why not? Because he wants to work. Wants us to work with him. Well, suppose I say you're here for me, but then you can work with me. <laughs> we still have a little bit. I still say, okay, Father, <laughs> lie down and put a cool cloth on your head. <laughs> work too hard. Take a rest. Because he loves us so much. What better would he give us? Himself. What was that? Himself. 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 It's nothing, 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 nothing greater. So when God says he made you for himself, he's saying he made you for the greatest of all possible things. Made you for the best of all possible reasons. You're here to know the best of all possible things. You're here to have a relationship of love and friendship with the greatest of all, of all possible things. And to work with me. The greatest of all, the greatest of all things. And that live with me to have a Right? If I say that, there's many greater things than me. <laughs> Half the difference. When God says that, nothing great about it. When God says you're made for Himself, it's nothing great about it. And God, when He becomes man, gives us Himself in a new way. Right? God keeps finding ways to give us Himself. There is a beautiful part of the Passover Seder, Jewish Seder. They were kind of recount in a living form the works of God. And they, they paused for everyone and say, would have been enough for us? That would have been enough. Who could, who could say we deserve it? You'd only given us Moses, that would have been enough for us. If you had, if you had, if you had, if you had Moses but hadn't gone and rescued us from slavery, it would have been enough for us. Rescued us from slavery and given us the law, it would have been enough for us. You keep, you keep going. Right? God was finding ways to give us himself. First of the prophets, by revelation, walked with us, becoming man. Everyone's with enough. He dies for us. He gives himself. 
I can receive from David. If it was a once in a lifetime thing, that would, that would be incredible. I can come to him every day. I can visit him any time I want to. <laughs> he keeps finding ways to give us himself. And there's nothing more to give. And so rather than what he does, he gives himself again and again and again and again and again. And again. So, part of my <laughs> each of these reasons, you see, God has the best desire to unite himself to us intimately and closely. He became one of us. So, greater this gift of God himself to mankind, the greater gift could be given. Some of the recipients of such a gift should always seek to make some return to the Lord for all his goodness to us. So, we owe God. Second, of course, our prayer of the and praise, and by our own law. It also happens principally at Rexford as the Mass to examine another section. Recognizing God's love for us, we want to respond. We want to act the sort of way. We want to give back to God. We can't give back to God perfectly, but yet God found a way. The first of all, simply recognition, praise, thanksgiving. How much of our prayer, just ask yourself this when you answer the answer a lot, ask yourself, how much of my prayer do I spend thanking God? How much of my prayer is more me telling God what I need? Or demanding that he gives me things? Or complaining to God with life's sorrow? Do I recognize his love? Do I recognize him? Do I recognize him? Do I praise him for who he is and what he's done? Do I respond by the way I live? Is my life different because I don't know Jesus? If people saw my life and saw me, would they say, oh, he's a follower? I wear a collar. But when people about wearing the collar, would they say, oh, he's a follower of Christ? Who's that guy? I wear a public sign. Is it my life? Do I, do I point out Christ's life in my following? What does it mean to be a follower, to the disciple? It means that your life reflects and points to the teacher, the master. You live like they live. You do what they did. You actually act. Am I grateful to God so that my way of life responds to this divine romance, to this divine life, this divine movement? I should. That's part of the work here. It's probably we have that room in the back there. You want to be able to respond to God the way He's given us. We also have class, which we'll look at, I think, in part three. Uh, and so God loves us, we love God, we respond to what God's done for us. Questions or comments for the one or the We can't give back to God. I mean, anything that. <laughs> Let me see how, how to say this. We can give back to God all the love that we have inside of us. Yes. But then at the same time, we can't give God anything that He doesn't already have. So, does that mean 
the love that we give is, like, <laughs> uh, say, strong enough to, to, like, be giving him a gift. So you know this, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, but, uh, let me let me hear what say. I think you're asking me. Tell me if I heard you wrong. Yeah. You're asking me is recognizing God so much greater than we are. That God's love is us better than we are. That God needs nothing. Does that mean that when I love him, weak as I am, small as I am, broken as I am, um, that it means nothing to him? Yes. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So the answer is absolutely not. It means everything to him. One of the beauties of free will is less is love. I think all too often we hear free will, we think free will lets me say no to God. Right? Say I'm not free to say no. This is one of my pet peeves, honestly. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> because free will is not what lets me say no to God. Free will lets me say yes to God. It's a very, very different thing. Now, it's true, free will can be misused to say no, but that's a misuse of, of, of it. Right? I mean, you don't define something by the way it's used wrongly. I can use my hammer to kill people, I can use a hammer to break boards. The hammer not breaking boards. It's like using that. I, I can probably find ways with a washing machine to mix cake. If I put the cake ingredients in the washing machine, or the dryer, it'll stir things around and a little, you know. But you know, that, this is, that doesn't mean fancy to define it, it's not what it's for. All too often we define free will by the misuse of it. We think, I can say no to God, I'm free. No. Free will is to say yes to God. But what God lets, wants the goodness of this world to come from you as well. God wants something that to be yours. He wants the response. He wants the response. He wants you to be able to say, I choose, I want this, I give you what I have. And so, yes, it's, it's true that, that God is, is greater than we are, obviously. But God wants your love. Not because of the amount there, not because it's only equal his, but it's something that's unique that, that only you can give him. And God waits for them. St. Bernard of Clairvaux is a beautiful homily on the March 20th Annunciation, where he talks about um, Angel Gabriel coming to Our Lady and asking Mary, will she be the mother of God? And he says, all of creation pauses and hold the breath, waiting for Mary's answer. And he says, everybody got to kind of earn this barrier to curb and say yes. You know, Adam and Eve are saying, please, Mary, say yes, and we'll be redeemed. You know, the, the angels are, are waiting with the bated breath. What does she say? You know, and all, all of praise is waiting. For you say yes, and let God be my man. The fact is this every bit of free will, in both sense, is the same thing. Where your yeses to God change everything. Because when you, when you say yes, you bring good into the world, you change the world forever. You say yes to God, love God, there's a difference in reality that, that, will, that will always be exist forever. And the love you bring in the world will always exist forever. Even if later on you reject God and end up in hell, you still say yes at one time. Even if you reject God and end up in hell, you still said yes to God and love God at one time. And that doesn't change. The reality doesn't change. Now, love is created, and, and so love can fix and heal brokenness and even sin. But sin can never destroy love. So, free will lets me say yes to God, and that is very, very precious to God. In the same way that the, in a, in a, in a tiny analogy, you know, 
when a toddler smiles at their mother. They most likely the toddler's love for the mom is pretty selfish. You know, mom's the walking food bowl. You know, mom's comfort. But does the mother around think the mother, your love is equal? My love for you. You didn't do what I did for you. You know, you're pretty selfish. You wouldn't suffer for me. You wouldn't sleep, let me sleep an extra night. No, it's like you cross your mind. And the smile that you see for your child makes it all work. Makes you not think of what they did wrong. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So, does your love for God, your smile at God, make a difference? Yes. Is it is all the equal? No. But does it matter to him? No. Because he wants you and loves you and desires your love. God desires your love. So basically, we could say free will is love for God. And, and not think of it in any other way. If you just look at free will, yeah. you love God. Positively well, that's all. negatively. Yes, yes, yes. That's all you would say. Yeah. Uh, I would say free, free will is the part of the that doesn't happen. Um, so love is an action. Free will is the part of the that lets you love. Um, so that's the part of, this is part of your soul. This is, this is the work of the soul. But, but yes, this, this, if it's working right, you're loving. But if you want to simplify it, it's not, it's not so wrong that it's going to really matter in the difference. It, it matters for philosophy courses or for, you know, technicalities. Um, and so it horrifies me when it's wrong. But in practical sense, it is probably okay to think about it. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Um, good. I don't need to interrupt you. No, no, no please. I, I much prefer these questions now. Already been said. In addition to asking the question of why, another question has been asked at the beginning of the Christian era has been how far the incarnation go? In other words, what extent the Son of Man of God truly become one of us? The answer to that the curse was given is rather straightforward. Or remaining fully God, something changed in God, is nothing different in God. He was also fully man, truly becoming like us in all things but sin. The implications of this, however, are immense. And they have the footnote later down, so I'll skip that a bit later. Yeah. So basically, this, this little section, these next four articles, 10 to 14, are asking what's it mean to say that, that, that God became man? What does this mean? Right. I mean, what, what are we talking about? Are we saying. And basically, we're trying to be able to say, in whatever way it makes sense to us, that he didn't stop being God. He remained God, remained eternally, infinitely perfect in heaven, and at the same time, truly became one of us. In every single way. That everything that matters about human nature and beings, he had and underwent. And he underwent more than that. When there are some things that, that, that don't um, he, under, he also underwent hard trials, difficulties, and struggles. He, he could have become truly human being without undergoing our struggle and suffering. He's a little bit of a real man. Yes, I'm going to be a real man, but I'm going to be a real man in paradise. I'm going to be a real man and, and be adored as a king, and I'm going to you know, have an easy life, I'm going to sit around eating different bonbons and Relaxing on cushions. <laughs> and it would be incredible that God did that for us. But God was more than that. He endured our suffering, our difficulties, was rejected, was mocked, was spat, was crucified. 
From how far did his become a man? What does it mean to say God became man? So, Article 11. First, let's examine what it means to become fully human. It means having a body composed of bones, muscles, flesh, and tissues. Physical body. Means having a rational soul. <clears throat> His powers of memory tell us of volition, so intellect and free will. You could say a mind and heart. I can think, I can know, I can love. Choose. <clears throat> Means having emotions, which is part of the body. Means having feelings like having a personality, which is kind of both things together. Or in this means we're male and female. In the image and likeness of God. So both of these together are made in God's image and likeness. None of this is greatly shocking to us, I'm sure. Let me just very briefly go into some of these terms I think are a bit confused. But, um, image and likeness aren't merely repetition. Image and likeness are for two different things. What's it mean to be a man in God's image? Do I have no one talk about these things? You come across before? Okay. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't image be exactly that? An, an image? And then likeness? Yeah, yeah, and likeness would be like them, but not the exact image of them. Well, we're image and likeness. How can we both do so? So. <laughs> image look like him. Yes, image would look like him, yeah. And likeness, like, so say your brother or something. Like God. I think you're on the wrong way. You're on the wrong but let, let, Let's tease it out. In what way do you look like God? When God doesn't have a body. Right. He took different people. He became man in the body now. But before he became man, he had a body. Right. So it's not like he has a face or eyes or, you know. Okay. So, how, how, why does it look like God? Our soul. Our soul? In what way? Our soul look like God? <laughs> it's got memory, it's intellect and will. Intellect and will. Stop. 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 Yeah. Okay. Intellect and will. So, we can know, we can love. The soul is made the image of God. Uh, it's the image of God. She first. It's the part of ourselves that make, uh, makes us free. The part of us that lets us know God. We form friendships. But then the image, because the human human person is a, is body and soul together, we're made to be body and soul together. The image of God extends to the body as well. Um, it begins in the soul. It's chiefly in the soul. This this is what makes us be persons. It makes us be God's image. But because we're one thing, we image God perfectly body. So even our, even our, our, our bodies image God in a lesser way. Um, and that's why in the emotions, things like the personality, things like the, these things have an influence to reflect that and share in the intellect and the will, the memory, the, the imagination, the mind, all these things. But the chief leads this one. What about likeness? Oh. 
Holiness. Holiness, Holiness uh, which comes from what kind of grace? Sanctifying, Sanctifying grace. grace, yes. Good. When Adam and Eve sinned, they, what, what did they lose any of this? When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they lose? So they stopped being like God. They are always God's image. Every human being is always made in God's image. We're not always like God. We can become more like God the holier we are. When you can't become more of his image, we can be less like God and more like God, but not more like him. It's remaining God's image and likeness. It wants us not to look like him and be like him as a child of God. It wants us to be holy, to be good, to be true, to be have this be one of his children. And so the, the, the fact of remaining God's image allows us to be like God. If, if we didn't have this, we couldn't receive this. The image never changes, the likeness can, can grow and grow and shrink. It can be more or less like that. Good. So this is a very brief summary of what it means to be a human being. Article 12. The ball is really a summary. Short of the version, short of the snapshot of what needs to be human being, human nature. Already it gives a deep insight to Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. In becoming one of us, he took all of this off. He took on a body, emotion, feelings, and even man. He took on a soul. He can think, he can love, he emotion, he fears, he had free will, the mind. He had a likeness to God of the same divine grace. He had made in God's image. As the Gospels clearly show, or the councils of the church defended, he truly was a man that his own flesh, his own body, his own mind, his own soul. That means he had hands that healed the sick, he that ached, as he walked into the pathways of Galilee and Jerusalem. He had hair that grew, which and teeth that chewed his food. He also really had emotion, a personality. She expressed her ways just like us. He cried in sorrow for the death of Lazarus. He rejoiced when he decided to turn her sex test for his first mission. Likewise, a man, he had friend with them. He even underwent temptations throughout his lifetime. He may have felt the sin because of that. There's a little out here who mentioned it. His life was genuine life. His suffering was bloody, and his death was real as he gets. Like us in all things but sin. So God becoming man, he wants to share everything. He wants to take on everything. He wants to be able to say, I understand everything. Right? The difference between somebody who says, I understand from afar, and someone says, I want to that too. I know what that feels like. I know what, what you mean when you say that. It's not that someone who hasn't gone through the experience can't know that, but it's different when someone can tell us, yeah, that happened to me too. And so Christ, when he comes to us, can say to us, I know exactly what you mean when you tell me you're tired. When you tell me you don't feel like that cross, you don't feel like that cross anymore. When you tell me that you're afraid, when you tell me that people don't, don't like you, when you tell me that they're rejected, when you tell me you've been betrayed, right? Christ knows exactly what you need. And as God, of course, he knows that perfectly. But as man, he experienced that. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, where it says that Christ grows in all, what it's talking about is he, is he experiences things with us. Are there certain experiences he didn't, he didn't have until he grew up? He was old. Doesn't mean that he learned all things like, oh, one day he figures out he's God. It's like one day he figured out all of a sudden who he is. 
Wes Nidell said he figured out who the job was. He always knew. He experienced it. He, learned, he, he lives it. Right? There, there are certain things only experience can teach you. Right? I mean, I know what it's like intellectually to lose a foot. It's different than losing a foot. You know? Intellectually, I, I know what it's like to, to break my leg. I broke one of my, my, my fingers. I can figure out what I'm doing. But I don't know what it's like to break my leg at the same time. And so Christ, growing in knowledge of wisdom, is trying to experience these things with us, walking with us, so we can say, yes, I understand this. In all things except for one. What's the one thing he doesn't sin? sin. sin. And that's the one thing that is in every single one of us. I almost feel like God should have came down here and fell and fell again and again and again and got back up and got back up and got back up and got back up because that's what we have to do. And he didn't. He was perfect and he was in a glass bubble. Like, and so it makes us feel like we're it's all And so and so, why didn't he experience sin? Because he can't. He's perfect. Sin is evil. And it's he also, it's evil. He's not good. It's also, it's human. He's not a human person. He's a human being. <laughs> but, 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 that last part. Yeah. That was, yeah. but is sin <laughs> part of human nature? Yes. No. No. No, it's not. We weren't created. Sin, sin yes. is a destruction. It's so much a part of the world that we're like drenched in. We are drenched in it. But this is the human nature. So what he does is trying to heal human nature, trying to fix human nature. He's trying to restore human nature. Human. To make us perfect. Not to make us sin. He wants to make us hell, not to make us sick. A sick doctor who has cancer and is dying isn't going to help you out very much. The doctor is broken bones and can't, can't the doctor has to get a proxy first to break all his bones before they can do surgery on him. He's not going to do a very good, good, a very good surgery. He's not going to be able to help you out. He's going to be, he's not going to have the bones to do that. What he's trying to do is he's trying to heal this, fix this. This is not part of our nature. See, suffering is compatible with being a human being. Sin is not. This is what he comes to heal and forgive and to redeem. But even our suffering, he sanctifies and he transforms. So our suffering then becomes that stuff that which he uses glory. But sin is not part of what this human being. We weren't made with, with sin. We were made with sin. Sin, sin makes us less human. Uh, the original sin comes from your mother. You're born with sin. But it's but but it's but it is a flesh or something. Like you're born with it. It affects you. It affects you. It affects you. It affects you. Absolutely. For five minutes. Um, or for years, or for no, it actually affects us. But but this is not human. This 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 is the negation. When we have sin. We're less human, not more. Sin makes you less of yourself, not more of yourself. It's the only thing that every single human being shares. I don't know. Every single human being has a mother and father, the body and soul. Every human being has a destiny for heaven and eternity. Every human being has a God who loves them and wants them to have. Not every human being has sin. There's two who don't. But they're not here. Like, I mean us, the real human people. Those who are like holy, they're in a different category. category. Yeah, <laughs> they're not us. But sin does not make you human. It's an experience we have because of Adam and Eve. But it doesn't make you human. Not really, because we can still choose to do things ourselves. Adam and Eve stuff gets wiped away when we're infants. And now we see this wiped away and we go to the thing. Like, as an excuse, like Adam and Eve did it. It's like they took that away when they were baptized. And when I do this, one taken away in that room. The rest of it is all yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But this doesn't make you more human. These are less human. Right. If, if I could offer my hand, my less able to work or more able to work. If I lose my leg, my less able or more able to walk. I'm less able. Yes. Sin is chopping away parts of my heart, parts of my soul. It's making it harder for me to become to be happy. Making it harder for me to be what I'm meant to be. Harder for me to be to love, to be good, to 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 do the right thing. This makes you less of yourself. That's the point. So Christ doesn't come to be less. He comes to make you more. He doesn't want you to have sin. The reason why he doesn't come with sin is because he wants to redeem these things. Everything he takes upon himself, he redeems, purifies, and heals. He doesn't come to take upon sin. He comes to take it away. It doesn't come to take away a body, it doesn't take away a soul, it doesn't take away intellect, free will, or emotions. It doesn't come to take away suffering, it comes to, to transform it, and then not take it away. It does come to take away sin. Only this keeps you from heaven. Nothing else does. Think about the original plan. Mm -hmm. Before Adam and Eve said, so, what was the plan of this? Wasn't that? Mm -hmm. And they decided to partake of the uh, tree of uh, well, knowledge of good and bad. And that was that tree of life. And what was the original plan for us? That wasn't part of it when he created the human being. But, uh, anyway, they messed up. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we messed up too, for sure. Yeah. It'd be nice to say it was only that. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's not really um, But but sin does not make you more human, and, and that is a very important thing to recognize and to hold fast to very deep. Is sin makes you less human? Sin makes make you more intelligent, makes you less intelligent. It makes you freer, makes you less. Free. Sin is a slavery of. Article 13. As I mentioned above, the implications of all this are enormous. St. Gregory Nazianus once explained why he said that everyone assumed the incarnation was not healed. This means to redeem man of his health, he was brought body, soul, and spirit. Christ assumed all the elements of human nature, although now what have been said. In other words, if Christ neglected some aspect of our human nature, he became one of us. That part of us would have remained unredeemed. We'd have only been partially saved at all. Christ would have been a failed savior the case for his work would not have been totally or complete. Would not have been finished. His abounding, generous, and perfect love for us, however, did not forsake a single portion of who we are. We'd be given new life in the entirety of our human nature. To becoming man and dying for us, Christ does take upon the effects of sin. Does he take without becoming guilty of those sins? Christ takes upon what the sin does to us. Christ takes upon our human weakness, it takes upon our human um, He does understand, believe me, he doesn't sin or reject God. He does understand falling. He does understand the effects of it. He does experience the consequences. He does experience being rejected and mocked and experience human shame. As, as he is spat upon, rejected, and told he is worthless. The soldiers tell, tell Christ that he is a sinner. And that's what people know of his, of his day. It was his boss and rejects God. He is a bad Israel. I know it. Christ suffered and died to take the, the weight, the penalty of, the, of all the sin of all mankind upon himself. But did he also not feel like he was the one guilty of all the sin at that point? Though certainly he was not. So it depends on what you mean by that. Um, so 
not in the sense like he was confused and was like, maybe I'm a sinner and I failed God. But um, if he experienced the emotion and the anguish and the, yes. Do you feel like the alienation from his father that a sinner would feel? Uh, to an extent, but, but, but not in the same way. Um, so the thing is, part of the alienation would have meant um, there are some people who would say that. Um, other people would, would, would say that. Um, the problem with saying that he experienced the alienation from God, that his face from him, would mean he lost for a few moments the the, the beatific vision. I mean, he would mean he lost for a few moments um, the union with God, and, and that's not possible. Not um, now, what is possible is the is that emotionally, the, 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 that the, the dark night of the soul, like with the saints, one of the great saints, um, were united to God perfectly. But still, still in their heart, in their will, in their emotions, felt nothing. In fact, felt nothing. Still in their heart, will, and emotions, what? What else? I didn't get the word. They felt abandoned. Felt abandoned. Felt rejected. Felt, yeah. Just say so, that. so, look at dark eye of the soul. But that's different than. Some people can take it too far when they say that God actually hid his face from Christ. Um, and that Christ stopped experiencing seeing God. That's too far. Like you lost sanctifying ones. That's too far. But certainly the emotion, the anguish, the way some of the saints experienced feeling about it, even though they knew that they worked, they had the feeling of that. Sure. And that kind of dark night of the soul. Yeah. Um, as long as you're too far. The effects of the sin. Yes. Right. And he knew deep down the truth. It wasn't like he was confused or confused or ignorant. But as you know, when you're in anguish, you, you can know perfectly well that it doesn't really matter necessarily what you feel. And so the, his intellect, his free will, were always with God. But his heart, his soul, after they never felt the deep anguish and the hurt and the rejection and Fusion and everything else. And, and, and so, yes, and it's, it's not saying it's not it too far. It's not going to go too far. They said he lost, he lost, thinking God was with him. That's where you yeah. said, like, um, that from the cross, he thought he had been connected. Yeah. But, and so that's that's too far. But was he just the he was quoting the scriptures. Right. Now, but it, what, was, what was the revelation of his heart? Yes. So did he feel that emotionally? Yes. Did he think that? No. Did he feel it? Probably yes. Why are you Yeah. So when he said that, wasn't that for the Jews for them to yeah. realize this, this is where Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't just whining at God. It was, it was several reasons. One, he was showing the depth of his love for us somewhere he was feeling. One, he was showing the Jews who he was by revealing the scripture to us. Uh, one, he was showing that the mystery he's praying. You know, so he's still in his, in his utter anguish, still in prayer and loving God, pointing toward God. He's not simply there suffering past, he's actively offering himself. So all these things are being shown by that one phrase. Uh, but, but, it is revealing his heart. It's, it's, it's not simply a random quotation. So, no, otherwise, he would have quoted, you know, the Son of Man came to heaven and then sat on the throne. But he quotes this, but he said, I feel this. But look at the rest of the verse. This is glory, this is victory, this is who I am. So he, he is quoting the Bible, he is praying, he is revealing himself. He also to say, I, I feel hurt, you know, both physically and spiritually. I've been abandoned by people I love. Um, you know, this is something I want, emotional. He weeps in the dark. Um, but he wants it deep down, so what's the majority of it? Because I have desires. 
because as human beings, we do have this push-pull where we both desire certain things and don't desire certain things. Um, having children is, do we desire or don't desire the same death? Depending, you know, the certain certain aspects of it, we don't want, but yet we desire. Um, and, and so, yes, we think about Christ on the cross. I mean, definitely he was really suffering. Definitely there was no mental and physical and emotional anguish. Definitely he felt those things. It wasn't like he was sitting up there going, ah, oh, this wonderful and comfortable. And said, no, it was, it, was, it was horrible. But at the same time, he never doubted God in despair or felt for the Lord. He never thought it was bad. He never thought it's over. He never, he never lost hope. So it's just, don't go too far, that's all I'm saying. Um, the, but no more thing is pretend. And, and that was part of the problem with, with some of the, uh, the heresies. They were saying God pretended to die. He pretended to die. He pretended to do these things. Oh, uh, sounds so funny. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I just returned the DVD that's over there. Um, Saint Lapita, uh, mm -hmm. from slave to uh, saint. Right. And she had one comment in there that really touched me. That is, she was older, and she ended up going to a Catholic church, and the uh, priest was there, and she saw the crucifix for the first time. She said, "Oh, he understands what suffering is, and abuse, and abandonment." I mean, she was. As a child, she was uh, taken as a slave and was right. abused and, you know, away from her family. And, you know, was, she was, right away, she saw what he understands, he knows. So I thought that was significant for her to yeah. on that right away. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, so he takes upon everything without losing anything. So he, he both is truly, fully, completely God which we really completely mad. So this is not part of making human beings. This is not something that makes us less human. And even our suffering is the Lord redeemed, right? I mean, a, the Lord, even now in heaven, has the marks to announce. They're glorious. And what it means that is that in heaven, our sufferings, our burdens, our tears, Psalm 56 says it counts. And they become for us then not something God passes hands and says, so don't worry about it, it's gone now. It's, it's, it's done. But God takes our suffering, takes our burdens, take, takes up our wounds, and uses those things to be our victories. And any tear we give him is not lost. It becomes part of our crown of heaven. It becomes glorious. So the saints say that you're able to tell what the martyr does in heaven, you're able to tell everyone's suffering. Not in a grisly, gory, horror movie kind of way, <laughs> but in a glorious way, we're able to say this person you know, had a bad marriage, this, this person was rejected by the friends, this person felt despair over life, this person had whatever it might be. We're able to say these are the tears that decorate. God uses those things to become their glory. God takes that, doesn't simply say, well, it's over, it's done with. God said, these very things have become your glory and your pride. Which is beautiful. Because they're not wasted. They're not for God, they're not for God. They're redeemed. So you just offer it to God? Just you know, talk to him, tell him what you what's bothering you, why you're suffering. Yeah. I just wanted to think that it's um, being glorified based on the pure. Yeah. Yeah, if you give it to God, God offers it. Offering things to God is not a metaphor, an allergy, or a. Shut up, it's not why not. Literally, what's happening is because Christ is mad, when Christ on the cross offers this humanity. The Son of God on the cross offers his body and soul to the Lord. To death and beyond. Through baptism, you're united to Christ. Through baptism, you can be joined to Christ. And so when you offer your, your sufferings, you're literally joining Christ on the cross, having a, a real share in his offering. 
But Christ, of course, is the center of the heart of that. Without Christ, there's no offer to make. We do it last, we do it offer it up. What you're doing it is you're literally taking your suffering, your pain, your, your fear, your whatever, and giving it to the Father through the hands of Christ. And in Christ and through Christ and with Christ, it becomes part of this act of love and adoration. It becomes transformed. So it goes from simply being pain and suffering and nothing to being love, adoration, imitation of God, adoring of grace. It makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. So offering it up, our suffering, our tears, lets them to go from being simply tears and, and pain to being salvation and more. Being love. There's two reasons why suffering is hard. We feel alone and we ask why. If we weren't alone and we knew why, we'd do anything. Because when Christ comes to die on the cross for us, we're not alone or because Christ is with us. Christ has died for us. Christ has experienced those things as even death. And then he comes in and he's transformed that. He gives us a new why. The old why may have been I was stupid or someone else was stupid. The new why is I love. I imitate my God. I mean, I am Jesus Christ. And now this becomes a place of grace and salvation. All the difference. Completely going to be very different. Yeah. Three more. Can you do this? It's easy to see that. How essential the incarnation <laughs> is to our redemption. Without it, we would still be lost in our sins. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> Without it, Christ might be truly a sufferer, die, and be raised. Uh, there's not man, he can't die, he can't suffer, he can't raise again. As in Paul puts it pointedly, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, it's worth it, it's not, it's empty. It's still your sins. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who fall asleep. For this reason, we can join St. Paul in saying, too, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But when Christ becomes man, it's not simply, simply to show us how like you guys, it's to make these things be saved. It's to redeem these things. He doesn't redeem sin, he redeems the effects of sin. He redeems suffering, he doesn't redeem sin. He heals and forgives sin, he doesn't redeem sin. He doesn't make it part of our humanity. So he takes upon these things that he raised to heaven and brought to God. It's not just that he takes these things, these things, and then forgets them. That's what the ascension is about. He's in heaven right now, he still has a body and soul, intellect, a memory, imagination, emotions, human heart, human face. Because that's what he wants from us. He wants us to have all these things in heaven with him. That's the point of the resurrection. That this body, must be like my body, like my emotions, like by whatever, the Lord says to us, this is going to be redeemed in heaven now. Perfected, purified, healed from everything that makes it not I think that's what it should be. Questions, comments? Yeah. If you. Is that an answer? <laughs> the Gospel of St. Matthew begins to end with a striking parable. In the first chapter, we hear that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, the book of Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, whose name will be to all man, which means God with us. At the end of the book, Jesus who is Emmanuel, Jesus who is God with us, tells the disciple that just before the ascension of the Father, Behold, I am with you always, God with us, God with you. We close the air. So you have this book here, Matthew is God's with us. He's can manage, he can't he's still is with us. Verse 16. We can draw from these two passages the fact that Jesus, even after ascending into the right hand of God in heaven, never abandons his people or his church. He does not leave us orphans, we hear in St. John's Gospel. Rather, he promises to stay with us all of us. He promises to extend his incarnation in this world in some way. He doesn't stop being that. He wants to this happen. This is, of course, of his church, this is the body. 
but particularly does the sack the Eucharist. And this is glorified body and blood hidden, the appearance of the bread of all. The sacrament of Christ's bread is without term. Just as Christ didn't leave behind his body and his soul, Christ didn't stop being God with us. And so part of this reality is that God is with us. God is here walking with us. God is here wanting to be with you, walking with you. Sitting with you, being with you, loving you, helping you. It's crazy. Beautiful. Crazy. This, this is the depths of what God is saying in love. Um, and this then prepares that. So because of this, we can have that. Because of this reality, we can have the Eucharist, which we'll look at then next time. Questions, comments? It's, uh, it's hard to grasp the, the duality of the divinity and the humanity and all in one creature. Yeah. And, uh, it God Almighty has infinite knowledge, but Jesus the human in this new nature, do we have that? No. Yeah. So, we have to pray to, to the Father to get inspiration, to instruction, uh, you know, to get his mission clarified and, mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, but yet, it just seems like he was checked in with his other half and said, tell me the answer to these things I'm wondering about. He could have, but he didn't want to. Um, are you right hand or left hand? Right. What happens if I do some things with your left hand? It hurts. It hurts. It's not going to be, be as good. It's not going to be as clear. It's not going to be as smooth. It's not going to be as clear. If you try writing with your left hand, it's going to be messy. It's, not, it's going to be very illegible. If you try carving with, doing your woodwork with your left hand, yeah. your, your, your shelf is going to be terrible. Shelf or whatever you're building. Be terrible. Yeah. Same creature. You're doing parts of it. Only one part, your right hand, had those skills. Yet, it's still really you. Um, and so Christ, yes, does know infinitely perfect in everything. Christ, but he still also learns and struggles and has to, that's a different part of it. So, and he chose to uh, exercise this in a human way. Not always, right? There are times he knows human parts. There are times where he's clear. He does, you know, you have divine knowledge. When we read soul, he can, you know, uh, obviously works miracles. Uh, but usually he, it's, it's, it's like you decide, I'm going to use my left hand to help, these, to help show these people everything. And if you were still not working, you can still do it. Uh, so, so Christ loves us enough was to handicap himself. I wasn't laughing at you, Father. <laughs> we just kind of gave Shit each other the same look at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just making a comment that, uh, kind of like what uh, Terry just said, that yeah. our minds are just so finite, it's, it's almost hard to imagine how his great love for us yeah. and I, I think it's it helps me to see your love for Christ the way you're so reverent at Mass um, mm -hmm. the way you handle the Eucharist how you handle Jesus you know that he's there which is what helps <laughs> good thank you you know what's funny is so I grew up with some incredible priests um one of the priests I grew up with had a nerve disease. He would collapse on the altar. Uh, literally. 
meaning he would go into convulsions and shake. Oh. Saying mass what was, was painful for him. Mm -hmm. um, and as a server, you know, I would literally have to catch him one time. So big, tall mass, so six mm -hmm. foot four. Very humbling for him to have to do, have help you know, from some teenage kid. You know, he would have to, he could kind of stand in the whole mass, he had to ride around a little chair. He said mass every day in love. And there were times, honestly, I swear to you, read souls. Uh, my job. Um, that's why I, that priest, another priest, you know, who's always the great figure of joy. And I, I'm, I'm not a melancholic. You know. People don't want to talk about a joyful life. <laughs> I'm very serious, you know, especially in the Mass. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the, but he was this very joyful, still a joyful priest. Still a joyful priest. Um, now I remember hearing in seminary, you know, your first Mass, and people were, all the new priests say, oh, yeah, my first Mass, I, I heard angels, or I got the spark with my body. And it was great, incredible. I was waiting. This would be cool. We all did my first mass. I feel all these things. As much as my first mass, I was waiting, you know, for the spark, for the great emotion to well up. Was I felt nothing. I heard nothing. Nothing happened. I panicked. I was like, did I do it wrong? <laughs> you know, did I fail? Did it really? Did I say it right? <laughs> and honestly, I, I have a deep because you know, when I was growing up, so of course at this point. And I can see Father Chris, I can see Father Rick, and I, and I, I, I know that's what it is. I don't doubt. That was me saying it. You know, I know me. I know what I am. And so honestly, I have a deeper faith now than I did before. Because now I'm relying upon it's, it's not the priest or the, but it, it's God. I'm relying. Um, but uh, <laughs> definitely the first few passes, I was a little bit of panic trying to figure out. What am I doing wrong? Am I saying wrong? What am I? Where, where, where do things fail? <laughs> but apparently that's just my family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a sister. Oh. Well, so, so when my dad talks about being baptized, and he was baptized with the people that all say, you know, I felt, you know, this electric shock when I was baptized. I felt this, and he said, that was that little bit. It was ordinary. But it wasn't ordinary. It was ordinary. I felt it. Or my sister getting her veil. All well, those sisters were weeping and crying, and it was the greatest thing that came to go veil. Okay. <laughs> we're weird, what can I say? <laughs> Other questions? Or okay. The next week we'll start part two. Part two. Um, how far do you think we can get? I don't know. Uh, uh, who knows? Let's let's we'll mm -hmm. cross our fingers and say through Article Twenty Five. We might not get that far. We'll see. Seven, seventeen, seventeen to twenty five. Twenty five. Okay. That'll be our goal. We'll see. Okay. Let's close the prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Eucharist. We ask that you may revive our own faith and our own love for you in the sacrament. And that we will provide the love and the faith of our parish and those all around us. Understand the great mystery of who you are and done for us. How you have redeemed us. We become your saints and your children in all things. We all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As, As it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.